a little past 5.30 and I think we're going to go ahead and uh, get started. Uh, we're missing a bunch of people tonight. I'm not sure. I've not heard from uh, anybody, so I hope they're on their way and okay. Uh, but we're getting close to uh, some holidays, so maybe, I don't know, people figured out a way to get out of town early. I don't know. Uh, but we have presentations today and we have a little work to finish up on an exercise that we started. This is exercise three. We have another exercise that we'll go through as a class later. Have a couple of videos to watch as usual uh, to kind of wrap up the concept of project manage, project cost management before we go into project risk management, which is the next topic that we'll experiment with. Uh, I think that you know some of you are doing last minute prep on your presentation. That's cool. So I think what we'll do first is we'll. We'll talk about, we'll, we'll watch a little video on making a presentation about 10 minutes long. Uh, then we'll talk about uh, problem three, the one that we kind of closed up class with. Some of you have that almost done. Maybe you finished it over the, the, the couple days. Uh, maybe not. Uh, we'll, we will finish that. I'll give you some time to finish that. And you can wrap up at that point in time too, anything on your presentation that you want. Uh, after that, uh, we're going to look at, I've got two videos on uh, cost management uh, that I want us to watch on, on the PMBOK, the PMI. Uh, it's chapter se uh, 7 of the, uh, the last version, not of this version, but it's the content that I want you to, to, to make sure we've talked about enough because this one's important. This one's super important. We've got to bring projects in on time uh, to the standard expected and uh, on on budget, so the budget is the tough one. It's easy uh, to make a deadline when money is not a factor. Uh, when money is a factor, which in my life is always, uh, it requires some ingenuity to drive projects uh, most economically, most efficiently, most leanly. So we'll do that, and then we'll have your presentations uh, for the Christmas party. Uh, we should have four of those, even though you are turning some things in uh, on Canvas or, or uh, direct uh, email attachment or text attachment, however you get it to me, hard copy is fine, uh, because I will be Xing everybody off, or give, you'll give credit for the presentation, even though it's a group project, everybody in the group uh, uh, that I've witnessed has had some level of participation. So that's the way we will, we will progress. We'll wrap it up and then we will be done tonight, however long uh, that takes. So let's start out with a little video. I, those of you that sit back in the back and like to watch that screen there, it's dead. I don't know what the problem is, but I talked to the IT guys just before class started and they go, huh. So they said, if the TV's bolted to the wall, normally we'd tell you to, to um, you know, to reboot it, you know, typical Microsoft kind of thing, you know, operating system. Uh, just unplug it, plug it back in, but I can't reach the plug. Uh, the pilot light on it, the red light that turns green when it operates, uh, the red light is blinking, but really like every 40 seconds or something. So it's not a fast blink. They've never heard of that, didn't think it could do that, so we're out of luck with that one. But with three other screens, we're going to be okay. Uh, I have a video going, and so when you make your presentations, I've got the camera a little closer, uh, and... and uh, uh, so if you'll make your presentation from this area here, uh, then you'll have a chance to take a look at your presentation on your own. Uh, you can video clip it and show it to mom and dad if you want, you know, uh, uh, if, if you like it. If you don't like it, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's your choice. When we talk in front of other people, lots of us don't like what we see, but it's always helpful for us to see it because then sometimes we can we can tweak it a little bit. Sometimes we can say, all right, I'm going to put my hands right here so I don't walk around so much. I'm just not going to, I don't like it when I walk around. Okay, uh, if that's how you feel, then put your hands here. And you wouldn't learn that except for watching yourself. So you'll have a chance today after your presentation, whoever makes presentations, to watch yourself. This will be posted uh, as the uh, other class videos are on the YouTube channel that you find just by looking at Steve Carwell, uh, hashtag Steve Carwell gets you there uh, to YouTube. And um, so does at Steve Carwell. Both of them, I think, get you to the same spot, I think. But if just Google Steve Carwell on YouTube and you'll get the, the choices that you have. 
we've got, I don't know, 20 or 25, probably 120 hours of video on there if you want to watch it. Uh, that'll, that'll put you everybody to sleep. Uh, some of you will remember it. Some of you have been watching, and thank you for those of you that have. Uh, uh, YouTube, as you know, keeps record of that. Uh, so from an analytics point of view, I know that you have, have done that, and that helps from a, a teaching perspective of giving credit for those that make up the class. So uh, that's I appreciate that for those of you that do. Let's watch a little video on making presentations, uh, and then we'll come to this project uh, uh, exercise number three that you were working on. So give me just a second. Let's start with this. Uh, how to speak so that people want to listen is the title of this nine minute, 58 second video. So it's not going to be very long and it, you can think about it. Now. <laughs> The human voice. It's the instrument we all play. It's the most powerful sound in the world, probably. It's the only one that can start a war or say, I love you. And yet many people have the experience that when they speak, people don't listen to them. Why is that? How can we speak powerfully to make change in the world? Well, I'd like to suggest there are a number of habits that we need to move away from. I've, I've assembled for your pleasure here seven deadly sins of speaking. I'm not pretending this is an exhaustive list. But these seven, I think, are pretty large. The habits that we can all fall into. First, gossip. Speaking ill of somebody who's not present. Not a nice habit, and we know perfectly well the person gossiping five minutes later will be gossiping about us. Second, judging. We know people who are like this in conversation, and it's very hard to listen to somebody if you know that you're being judged and found wanting at the same time. Third, negativity. You can fall into this. My mother in the last years of her life became very, very negative and it's hard to listen. I remember one day I said to her, it's October the 1st today, and she said, I know, isn't it dreadful? <laughs> it's hard to listen when somebody's that negative. And another form of negativity, complaining. Well, this is the national art of the UK. It's, it's our national sport. We complain about the weather, about sport, about politics, about everything. But actually complaining is viral misery. It's not spreading sunshine and lightness in the world. Excuses. We've all met this guy. Maybe we've all been this guy. Some people have a blame thrower. They just pass it on to everybody else and don't take responsibility for their actions. And again, hard to listen to somebody who's being like that. Penultimate, the six of the seven. Embroidery. Exaggeration. It demeans our language, actually, sometimes. For example, if I see something that really is awesome, what do I call it? <laughs> and then, of course, this exaggeration becomes lying, out and out lying, and we don't want to listen to people we know are lying to us. And finally, dogmatism. The confusion of facts with opinions. When those two things get conflated, you're listening into the wind. You know, somebody is bombarding you with their opinions as if they were true. It's difficult to listen to that. So here they are, seven deadly sins of speaking. These are things I think we need to avoid. But is there a positive way to think about this? Yes, there is. I'd like to suggest that there are four really powerful cornerstones, foundations, that we can stand on if we want our speech to be powerful and to make change in the world. Fortunately, these things spell a word. The word is hail, and it has a great definition as well. I'm not talking about the stuff that falls from the sky and hits you on the head. I'm talking about this definition, to greet or acclaim enthusiastically, which is, I think, how our words will be received if we stand on these four things. So what do they stand for? See if you can guess. The H, honesty, of course. Being true in what you say, being straight and clear. The A is authenticity, just being yourself. A friend of mine described it as standing in your own truth, which I think is a lovely way to put it. The I is integrity being your word, actually doing what you say, and being somebody people can trust. And the L is love. I don't mean romantic love, but I do mean wishing people well. For two reasons. First of all, I think absolute honesty may not be what we want. I mean, my goodness, you look ugly this morning. Mm, perhaps that's not necessary. 
Tempered with love, of course, honesty is a great thing. But also, if you're really wishing somebody well, it's very hard to judge them at the same time. I'm not even sure you can do those two things simultaneously. So hail. Also, now that's what you say, and it's like the old song, it is what you say, it's also the way that you say it. You have an amazing toolbox. This instrument is incredible, and yet this is a toolbox that very few people have ever opened. I'd like to have a little rummage in there with you now. Just pull a few tools out that you might like to take away and play with, which will increase the power of your speaking. Register, for example. Now, falsetto register may not be very useful most of the time, but there's a register in between. I'm not going to get very technical about this for any of you who are voice coaches. You can locate your voice, however. So if I talk up here in my nose, you can hear the difference if I go down here in my throat, which is where most of us speak from most of the time. But if you want weight, you need to go down here to the chest. You hear the difference? We vote for politicians with lower voices. It's true because we associate depth with power uh, and with authority. That's register. And we have timbre. It's the, the way your voice feels. Again, the research shows that we prefer voices which are rich, smooth, warm, like hot chocolate. Well, if that's not you, that's not the end of the world. Because you can train. Go get a voice coach. And there are amazing things you can do with breathing, with posture, and with exercises to improve the timbre of your voice. Then prosody. I love prosody. This is the sing-song, the meta-language that we use in order to impart meaning. It's root one for meaning in conversation. People who speak all on one note are really quite hard to listen to if they don't have any prosody at all. That's where the word monotonic comes from, or monotonous, monotone. Also, we have repetitive prosody now coming in, where every sentence ends as if it were a question, when it's actually not a question, it's a statement. <laughs> and if you repeat that one over and over, it's actually restricting your ability to communicate through prosody, which I think is a shame. So let's try and break that habit. Pace. I can get very, very excited by saying something really, really quickly, or I can slow right down to emphasize. And at the end of that, of course, is our old friend, silence. There's nothing wrong with a bit of silence in a talk, is there? We don't have to fill it with ums and ahs. It can be very powerful. Of course, pitch often goes along with pace to indicate arousal, but you can do it just with pitch. Where did you leave my keys? Where did you leave my keys? It's a slightly different meaning in those two deliveries. And finally, volume. I can get really excited by using volume. Sorry about that if I startled anybody. <laughs> or I can have you really pay attention some people broadcast the whole time, try not to do that. That's called sodcasting. <laughs> Imposing your sound on people around you carelessly and inconsiderately, not nice. Of course, where this all comes into play most of all is when you've got something really important to do. It might be standing on a stage like this and giving a talk to people. It might be proposing marriage, asking for a raise, a wedding speech, whatever it is. If it's really important, you owe it to yourself to look at this toolbox and the engine that it's going to work on, and no engine works well without being warmed up, warm up your voice. Actually, let me show you how to do that. Would you all like to stand up for a moment? I'm going to show you the six vocal warm-up exercises that I do before every talk I ever do. Anytime you're going to talk to anybody important, do these. First, arms up, deep breath in, and, and sigh out. <sighs> like that. One more time. <sighs> Very good. Now we're going to warm up our lips and we're going to go bo, 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 bo. Very good. And now just like when you were a kid. Now your lips should be coming alive. We're going to do the tongue next with exaggerated la 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 beautiful you're getting really good at this and then roll an R that's like champagne for the tongue finally and if I can only do one the pros call this the siren it's really good it starts with we and goes to or the we is high the or is low so you go we fantastic give yourselves a round of applause take a seat thank you Next time you speak, 
do those in advance. Now, let me just put this in context to close. This is a serious point here. This is where we are now, right? We speak not very well into people who simply aren't listening in an environment that's all about noise and bad acoustics. I have talked about that on this stage in different phases. What would the world be like if we were speaking powerfully to people who were listening consciously in environments which were actually fit for purpose? Or to make that a bit larger, what would the world be like if we were creating sound consciously and consuming sound consciously and designing all our environments consciously for sound. That would be a world that does sound beautiful and one where understanding would be the norm. And that is an idea worth spreading. Thank you. Well, now you've got to make a presentation. So uh, I don't know if you need to warm your voices up or not. Uh, this is not a requirement of the class. I thought it interesting, though. I thought it interesting about, we do want to say things that are listened to and heard. We want to get our point across. And the start of the content of what we're talking about often shuts people off that we're talking to. Uh, especially in a setting where we're not making a presentation, maybe we're just having dinner with some friends. And by the end of that, they're tired of hearing us because of the content. So if we want to make a point and get something across, even to our friends, those first rules that he talked about, the seven deadly sins, if you would, of the content of what we talk about, I think that's important. Uh, the issue about the voice is something I've always been very self-conscious of. I do not like the sound of my voice. I don't like the pitch, the way I'm born, I can't change my vocal cords, I can't change my height, I can't change, I could change my weight maybe, uh, they say it could, but I, I've not seen that happen. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and we're born with certain things. But those of you that are born with, with a, a gifted physique or a gifted intelligence or a gifted voice, uh, we ought to be aware of that and we ought to use that for our advantage when we can. Um, uh, Brennan was born tall. And tallness, whether you like it or not, gets promotions in business faster than shortness does. That's illegal, that's weird, that's wrong, but it is. And maybe we can break it, and you're not gonna take complete advantage of it, but recognizing that that's, that's a gift that you have. You have more power because of your stature. And those of us in the room that are shorter, Sometimes, if we think about that, we feel weakness because of our height. I don't like standing in a group of NBA players, and they're like this. I've not been there often, but I did consulting for one of the teams, and, and, and I feel weak. And that's imposed by one person only. That's me. I impose that weakness. But so it, does it come through? In all likelihood, it does. And so the, 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 the ability to to take the natural features that we have and either ignore them if there's not something we can do to change them or value them and develop them a little bit. We can develop a broader range of tone in our voice. We can develop different speeds that we talk at. I mean, we already have done that. If you listen to yourself at home, you already do that. There's a the little sing song in your voice also that sends messages. You know, the up and down that, that he gave a name for and and we probably hadn't seen that name before, prosthicity. No, that wasn't the name. But anyway, uh, uh, the temper uh, of, of where of where we we have a range that we can talk in. Some of you, I think you, you could you could all uh, listen to this for one second. I think uh, <clears throat> Andrew, you have a powerful voice, and I don't know if you've ever thought that you had a powerful voice, I know. but you do have a powerful voice. And laugh. Uh, and laugh. <laughs> okay, you're from across the shop. That's a good thing. But, but that's a gift that you have, and, 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 it, and it's powerful because of a lot of things. It's, it's the, did he say that the lower the voice, you, the more votes you get in an election? Did you hear him say that? That's crazy, but it's also true. And, and so a lower voice, among males especially, resonates 
and it has a certain amount of power with it. And if you are aware of that, there's also a time where it can be intimidating. If you are talking, trying to match tones and voice with Josie, Josie can't talk as loud as you do. Probably, I don't know, maybe you can. You're able to? <laughs> well, you're not in class. You speak quietly and softly, and that's a gift in the setting as well. Because some of us can't dial it back. You know, but if we want to be more persuasive with various groups, this is just a 10 minute video to kind of open a thought process. I have found that if I take these videos and post them on YouTube, uh, on the channel for this class, or when they're embedded in the video like this one, will be often YouTube picks it out as a copyright infringement and will blank that portion of the class video out. Uh, I have to prove that they do it can blank the whole video, or they will just cut the segment that infringes, which is often like something like this. I don't know if this is copyrighted or not. I won't know until I post it on YouTube, but they may elect to cut this out of tonight's class video. They have on other times, on some other occasions. So I will post this on Canvas, uh, where many of the other videos that we've shown in class are also posted. If you dig around Canvas, you can find them under files. Uh, and that's, that's where they're at. Uh, and so I, because some of you might like to refer back to this and then go, how do you find that? You know it's on YouTube, but how do you find it? So I will post it on Canvas uh, in the event that it gets bleeped out on our LinkedIn uh, feed for tonight's class. Because I think it's cool stuff. I think it's worth looking at again. It's a nine minute, 58 second video. And if you want to remind yourself of some of the stuff that's in the toolbox, or if you want to teach somebody you live with. Maybe you've got a teenager that hasn't been exposed to those concepts and not aware of the tools that are in their toolbox. And if they're like me and they have a voice that they don't like the sound of, you can teach them how to exercise that voice and to use it to the maximum that we can. Uh, and and uh, uh, that's, a, that's, that's a choice. But you know, if we're trying to develop all the facets of our skill set, Leadership sometimes requires making a connection. And if you are, if you have, you know, you've heard the Minnie Mouse squeaky voice somebody has and they're born with that and they can't help it, uh, they have to still live with it. And so they have to compensate for that another way. And if you find that there's something about your presentation that you don't like, then you can compensate for it in some other way. And he talked about coaching and coaches, and there's an awful lot of that that's free online that you can study or look into. Uh, and and all, all aspects of who we are and how we present uh, have an impact. And if you notice, there aren't very many pop singers that can't dance. Well, what's, what is the correlation between dancing and singing? Well, we find that there's really none except for if you want to sell records or you want to sell uh, uh, you're, you have to be able to have a show, put on a show. It's part of the thing. It has nothing to do with singing, but it's part of showmanship. And so those that can sing well have to learn to boogie a little bit if they want to record anything and have, and have a following on TikTok. It's just got to be. And so uh, our world is, is, is changing in one little bit that it's not all single media. More of our, our world is now multimedia to the, for all of us for everything we do, including being at work. And, and so uh, being aware and kind of dialing up our game a little bit is an option that's within uh, striking distance for all of us. So that was not to make you feel bad about your presentations you're gonna make today. Uh, it's more just for your long-term game plan to recognize that, hey, there's cool stuff I can work on. I think that what he talked about was silence is interesting. I've used silence often in teaching. I'm not naturally inclined to silence. Silence is bothersome to me, my personality. I want to fill silence with sound. I want to talk, somebody's quiet and I'm talking to them, I'll fill it with words. And if you're negotiating, you lose at that point. Uh, you shut up, stay shut up. <laughs> Just listen, you know, be silent, use silence. I've stopped in class sometimes and that pause will cause somebody to look up. What happened? Did you fall over dead? What happened? You know, and, 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 and the silence gets attention. 
even though it's nothing. It's not like that siren sound that he made. Uh, the silence itself gets attention just naturally when we, we're making talks. So with that, Josh, are you related to Steve Lemon at all? Uh, we're Steve Lemon. <laughs> oh, no, there's more than one. OK. Well, there's two. There's a Steve Lemon that runs that like real estate real stuff out in Hurricane, off his family. Uh, my dad was a, a musician. His name was also Steve Lemon. And a studio? Spiral Studio, that's who I was looking for. Spiral Studios has made a living with sound. Uh, was considered probably one of the go-to studios in between Las Vegas and Salt Lake for sure, and maybe maybe broader than that in influence, I don't know, but pretty cool that it was right here. It still is or not? Uh, it went out of business back in 2017. My, my dad finally shut it down. Okay. Well, gifted, gifted talent uh, in, uh, in the art and when we're talking about sounds and voice quality and all of this stuff, he can magically do electronically to some of the stuff and make our presentations better by, by changing pace and, and pitch and, and these kinds of things. And, and, and the studio focused at least some part of the time on commercial things that um, people pay big money to get right. And there aren't very many professionals that are able to do it right. And we had one of those studios right here uh, locally. I'm sorry to hear that it shut down because it's exactly kind of what we found off of what we talked about here. And so I'm pleased to know he's your father. That's cool. Uh, all right. So let's go to exercise three where we left off. You were in teams and uh, we were solving a network diagramming problem. So get together, back together with your teams. I know that uh, one of the teams was just about done. I'm not sure uh, where you were at, but let's get everybody on the same page and then let's talk about what we learned and how we went about this. So this is the, you have this in a handout. Uh, I've sh it's on the, on the slides right now. We're looking at question three and I'll review it. As a project manager at for Good Stuff Enterprises. We have the responsibility for the development of a new series of advanced intelligent toys for kids called Master Blaster. Based on a preliminary idea, top management has given us a green light to a more thorough feasibility study. As the toy should be ready before the Christmas season, we've been asked to investigate if we can finish the project within 30 weeks. The tasks that need to be carried out during the project have been broken down into a set of individual atomic tasks called activities. For each activity, we need to know the duration of the activity and its immediate predecessor. For the Master Blaster project, the activities and their data can be seen in Table 3. First assignment, derive an arrow on activity on node, AON activity on node project network for the project. That's the kind we've been drawing with boxes. Find the earliest and latest start and finish times, which activities are on a critical path. And we have the table that shows the description of product design, market research, productive production analysis, product model, marketing material, cost analysis, product taste testing, sales training, pricing, and a project report. And we have the predecessor and dependency uh, table here, the duration in weeks from uh, two weeks to 10 weeks. And in question B, Top management reviews our project plan and comes up with an offer. They think 28 weeks will make the product available too late in comparison with the main competitors. They offer an incentive of $40,000 if the project can be finished in 25 weeks or earlier. Quickly, we evaluate every activity in our project to estimate the cost of crashing and by how much we can crash each of the activities. The numbers of that analysis uh, of the project are shown in Figure four. So here we have a list that shows the, the first pass duration of each of those projects. And then uh, after we crash them, what du duration we could get it down to. So in other words, you might see that activity G, we think we can only crash a week. Activity I, we can't crash at all. And if we do the crashing, how much will it cost 
per week to do that crack. So the questions remaining is what is the cheapest way of reducing the project duration to 25 weeks and how would we do that? And then do we take the offer by management and the offer that's incentive of $40,000, uh, does that make good sense to us? And then let us assume that the incentive scheme set forward by top management instead of giving a fixed date and bonus specified a daily bonus. Suppose that we will get $8,500 for each week that we reduce the project length. Describe how this can be solved in our model and what the solution to the project will be. And now, construct the project crashing curve that presents a relationship between project length and the cost of crashing until the project is crashed by four weeks. We have not built one of those yet. This, will, this is our first assignment at coming up with a crashing curve. And that's re, uh, relating the time and cost. So the, the gain in time and the cost that would cost us in order to get that gain in time. That's a drawing of that. So uh, I will leave the table up here. You all should have access to somebody's paper that gives the table of precedence. But I will put the crashing schedule up here. And we can, we can refer to that. Now get together with your team. Catch yourself up. I need everybody to have a drawing. And we'll see if we got some agreement on what those drawings look like. And if you haven't seen a cool drawing yet, take a look at the ones that Mitch has been making if you walk around. A bunch of you have got nice drawings. Mitch has got like a... On point. Yeah, it's like, yeah, it's, it's a computerized drawing. <laughs> Pretty cool.
sorry, what was it? On C, right, it asks us to crash by, is it a total of four weeks or an additional four weeks after we crash on D? Um, I think it should be an additional. An it, additional? I, I read it that it was just four weeks, but I think as I reread it, we're going down lower. Okay, yeah. so instead of instead of 25 weeks, we want it to 21 weeks. Yeah. <laughs> Might as well just crash the one. <laughs> All right. Let's go for it. All right. So let's do the math. I'm not even like you guys are saying the math to crash down to 25, right? So what do we do? So yeah, we have to complete the problem with the wrong view of this thing. Oh, that works. So we have a piece of paper.
So we will we will draw a five nine.
<laughs> Looks like everybody's close to an answer. But if it's the right one, there are not answers. They're, they're marked in small. I not, my might not be right Martin either. Small. They found me in an error last time. But overall, we made well, a profit. Uh, we'll see if we can't get this, get this figured out. All right, so whether your drawing is like mine or not, I'm just looking for if, if I've got it interpreted fairly much correctly uh, based on the tables that we have. So do I have, let's walk through this anyway for a minute. Uh, and see if we all get agreement on the first critical path. Uh, we got the critical path of uh, A, C, F, I, and J. Did we get agreement with that? Yes. There was a second critical path that was A, E, H, I, and J. So those two are critical paths because they both resulted in a 28-week time frame. We agree with that? So if you don't agree with that, uh, I'll post this up on Canvas, and you can refer to this drawing if you can interpret my scratches. I made some mathematical errors on problem example two that you helped me understand. So to go to a target of 25 weeks, that means we have several things that we have to work on, right? And there's a charge of crashing stuff. And I put those, those charges in on in black ink for each, each activity. So for A, there's a charge of $8,000. Uh, C, there's a 9,000. F, there's a 6,000. I, there's no charge because you can't crash it. And J, you can crash for 9,000. Is that right so far? Okay, so uh, the other critical path, A, E, it's 11,000 bucks to crash E, 5,000 to crash H. Once again, I and J are the same as we just said. So we've got the cost of crashing. And uh, I kind of did it this way. Uh, there's a better way. I ran out of paper. There's a better way of <laughs> planning over again and copying it right. So I started at the bottom to crash one week for $8,000. I crashed A. Let me see if I can uh, get both of these. I guess I have to go back and forth like this. So I crashed A one week, and that drops our critical path to 27, if we were to do that. Uh, then I crashed, uh, to crash two weeks, I crashed A twice. I heard some of you doing the same thing. Why did we pick A? Because on, let me see if I can do this a bit. Let's see if I can do that that way. Okay, so to crash with week two, it's A and A twice, because we can crash it more than that. Uh, and that's $16,000 to do that. So if I were graphing it, we, to get one week off cost me eight, to get two weeks off cost 16. Now, when I first did this, I did three A's, but what happens if you do three A's? If I reduce one week A three times, I now have 28 down to 25, but I've got another critical path that's a 26. I have a new critical path. So I can't go A, A three times. I have to crash one of the other things that's in the critical path. Fortunately, 
The new critical path is 26 weeks, which is ACFJ. And we have J appearing in all three of those. So if we were to crash J, we further reduce this critical path by a week, this critical path by a week, and this critical path by a week. So we're down, does that make sense? So we charge ourselves, J, the reason I didn't want to do J is because it's $9,000. It's more expensive, right? But we have to do it. So AAJ, now when I say we have to do it, there's other ways to do this, right? You could have chosen to crash F. And then you'd have a problem here. You could have had to do E and F, cost you more. We're looking for the lowest way to reduce one more week. And in this case, it's AAJ. That gets us down to 25 weeks. Now, now we can do another A and get us down to 24, right? Because A is on all, all three of those critical paths. So that gets us down to 24. Our cost is at $33,000. Then what do we do? <laughs> What do you guys do next? We didn't crash G, we only crashed it seven times. We crashed it eight. Yeah, because he's going, he's trying to take he's trying to do C as well, right? Uh-huh. So after after he crashes the three weeks, right? And he goes to crash four, five, six, seven, and eight, now he's working on C. Okay. I didn't, didn't crash C until uh, we did yes. Ever. I didn't crash C ever. So we might be able to bleed. Oh, I did crash C. I crashed it on the seventh week. Yeah, yeah I did crash C. So the totals of what I crashed, the, what I crashed added up to $87,000 cost to get us down to. Why would you, block, why would you, um, I guess we just, uh, we'll let you run through it. No, go ahead. Well, why would you crash C? I crashed C the last week. No, G. D? G. G. Golf. Okay, golf. golf. Okay, we go. uh, because at week 22, my, I have a new critical path. So initially, so you're going beyond, uh, no, never you're mind. going beyond four weeks, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm going beyond four weeks, yeah. Okay, now does that take you down to week 21? I, I, so one week takes us to 27. 26, 25, 24, 23, 22, 21. At eight weeks, at 20 weeks, I thought you can't do it. So if you crash A three times, right, your new critical path of A, D, G, J, right, if you crash A three times, it's down that brings to 20. it down to 20. You're right, so I don't need to crash G ever. Correct. That's I wasted $16,000. You did. Okay. <laughs> I, oh, it's seven thousand. I wasted seven thousand dollars. So I came up with a cost of eighty-seven thousand, and it could have been done for eighty. Uh -huh. we came up what with you 50, guys are thinking? We came up with fifty-one thousand. Whoa! Fifty-one thousand to, to get to twenty profit, weeks. To get twenty-one. To get to our profit for just C was was eighty-five hundred. Yeah, we only made eighty-five hundred dollars to get it down to twenty-one weeks. Yeah, but I'll take eighty-five hundred bucks. I can buy yeah. a Corvette. Okay, so five hundred a week bonus. Unless our math is wrong. And you guys are welcome to check it. We could be wrong. We could be in the hole. Uh eighty five hundred bucks. You know what I mean? We did go we did miss the uh the week three crash because we just it did eight three times. Right. Right. I did two at first. Uh, yeah, and it didn't work. So I need to, yours. what I will do, I will take the assignment here. I will redo my numbers on a better chart that you can read, and I'll plot it on a computer plot that you can read so that you'll see the chart that I've got, and then we'll talk about that in the next class. Uh, if I've made a mistake, which is real possible, maybe I'll find it, or maybe I'll just publish it as this is, and you can look for the mistake, and we'll compare with what you've got at that point.
Does that work okay for everybody? Okay, uh, that works okay. It's 6.48, we better take a break and we better come back and do our Christmas party presentation. So uh, you decide what order. We got team one, two, three, and four. If you go in that order, you guys decide what order you want to do your presentations in. We'll take a break right now and we'll come back to your presentation. Do to 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 so know. are you paying for A out of the forty thousand on top of the eighty five? I don't know about that yet. I don't want to look at that yet. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna redraw the I'm gonna redraw the network diagram at the end of every crash. So every week I'll redraw it. So right now we're doing it in our head. Right. And 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 there's a high likelihood that I made a mistake doing it in my head. So I'll redraw it and and uh, Yeah, sixty seven. You think 67? 67K. All right. To crash, to crash down to 21 weeks. Okay. Right? Now, if we go 8,500 per week and we crashed it three, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, um, we're still profit. We're still 8,500. So you're 85,000. Well, and, and the fact is, you got it done early. Right. right. So it may be yeah, you can make more money on the next project. Obviously, management thinks it is because they're giving you an incentive. Right. Yeah. And so they want to get it in a, ahead of schedule. over the years, uh, he used to do a fair amount of stuff at the Dixie Business on the Arts and did all kinds of meetings with there. And uh, you know, companies like uh, way back in the day, Warren Key, and Warren Key's gone now, and they're not the best of their And uh, uh, it's been a long time. I'm trying to think of other clients that we worked together on the source. He and I never, <coughs> he and I were never sitting like this.
interesting with that. <laughs> he was doing kind of the same thing with Lovely. Okay. Uh, but realized it was too far away from family because his um, stepmom was in love with him and went to law school. And he's like, you know what? I don't want to take another call for my mom. I'm going to go to Salt Lake. He's in the same business. And he's still doing like shows and random stuff there. I don't know who it is for. Yeah. But like, he helped out with Comic Con and X, X cool. um, other stuff. So that is something. Some people are generating all their own content all the time. But some people aren't. Some people have just got something crazy. They said, this is your video, you know, but your cat did something stupid. And the next thing you know, you got a cat compilation and all these short ones and, and, and it's got two million hits and you go, You didn't make any of none of those were good cats, you know.
Who's inning first? Team one, team two, team three, or team four? Okay, and your team three? Team one. Your team one. Okay, go for it. Looking dongle here that you've ever seen, though. This thing has got. You got one of those that's got to be ready to do it, and then we're going to switch this over to. Didn't stick. Row. Maybe we'll just turn the whole thing off. Maybe it's a wiggle in the yeah. cord here. That could be. Maybe we can do it really fast. You go fast. <laughs> <laughs> we got three, three seconds for this one. Oh, yep. Gather all the information. Okay, it's back. Go. All right. <laughs> so our company is iPhone. You may have heard of us. We compete with iPhone. iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> um, our team members were Landon, Josie, Brennan, and myself. Here we have a picture of the team with Santa. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, I, the beer in the middle, I know, looks a little like. Uh, Did you hire Andrew for Santa? Yeah, a little hey, like hey, Andrew, hey, but it's not. Uh, so this is our project charter, and uh is our president. So she'll go over this. Yeah. So for our Christmas party, our business case was to improve employee morale and show our appreciation mm -hmm. and kind of celebrate everything that they do for us. We had some issues with communicating just because we were all gone at different times for different classes, but in the end it all worked out and we were able to reach out to each other via email on the canvas and everything, so it ended up working out. Um, our scope was to make an amazing Christmas party in the constrained amount of time that was um, allotted to us, and our goal was to again boost employee morale and show our appreciation for all that they do. Uh, to define it, it was to plan a party. To measure it, we used a Gantt chart mostly. And then um, to improve what we were working on, we went through many changes and looked at a bunch of different options for party things and entertainment and 
price-wise and stuff like that. And yeah. And then Brandon here was in charge of our budget. So. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's going to be a party. <laughs> some people might call it overkill, but it's, 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 it's just normal. Um, yeah, we ran up a pretty high budget. We did, we had 32 people. And then we had like plus ones for them, but they didn't really count in anything except for, um, well, actually, they didn't, yeah, except for catering. But we gave everybody five hundred dollar bonuses. Okay. Gave them all iPhones. Okay. And then we only did a half day. So what? What did we had like six to noon or something for the day, and then nine to noon, and then the rest of the day they had off. So we we lost twelve grand, almost thirteen grand for the half day. However, you're improving morale, right? So you got to make that money yeah. back. Right? We're making more than that on the sales yeah. of the phone. Yeah. Yeah. We're making, yeah. Yeah. And then we did our arrow on node for um, the activities, which translated into our Gantt chart for our timeline. Wow. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if I can blow this up here. But basically, we worked. From, we had them work from nine to ten forty uh, ten forty five, and we did our party set up. We had a few employees starting at twelve or eleven to get it done by noon so at lunchtime, so they could punch out and enjoy the party. Uh, the party ran from twelve to two. Uh, we had the own, uh, Josie gave a speech from twelve forty five to one o'clock. I don't have that recorded, but. <laughs> um, we did our bonus handout during the speech where Brenna and myself and uh, Landon went around and passed out the $500 and the phones uh, for the gifts. We did our cleanup at 2 o'clock to 3 o'clock and the employees got to go home. Um, how do I do that back? That was our Christmas party. The network diagram didn't stay up there very, very well. <laughs> but, but, but you, how did you diagram? What was the general thought of the diagram? Um, so basically, we did both. It was one. Both were critical class. Even when we hit our uh, uh, gifts and our bonus handouts, we both started at the same time. Um, in order for those to get done, for the party to finish and start the cleanup. Is that what you're okay. asking? That's, yeah, that's, I just wondered how you went through it, but you did. Okay, that's yeah, good. Yeah, we, I, I guess I cheated the timeline since we got to do it, so I was going to go in a straight line, but I thought, you know, we'll do the bonuses and the gifts at the same time, so that'll so cause us a So, what do you there. buy an iPhone for 570 bucks for? That's how much it costs us to make the iPhone. Oh. Okay. Actually, that's how much it costs Apple to make theirs. Ours is actually like 565 so. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So you gave them away at cost. Yeah, we, I, we had to look it up at cost. Yes, of what it costs us to make an iPhone. Okay, that's cool. You included lost time, yes, as we well, and that's that's a lot of times project managers doesn't include that because they forget about it. But it's a real cost. You know, it's what 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 would productivity have been had they been here, and and then you weighed it correctly. You know, you get a benefit out of that. You know, give me five hundred bucks at iPhone and a party. I'm at least happy tomorrow. And if you don't yeah. like the iPhone, you can re-gift it. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> well, you shouldn't be working for iPhone if you right, right, right. <laughs> you don't like iPhones. All right. What do you think? All right. Let's yeah. Yeah. Good job. Okay, that's team one. Let's just go with team two.
kind of created the company. We called it, what did we end up calling it? Last minute. Steel wall appliances. Steel wall appliances because uh, <laughs> Eli works for a steel mill, two wall bed people, and she works for an appliance shop. Right. So <laughs> we didn't have a lot of uh, budget going on. We have about 100 employees. And so we stuck to about a $10 per person budget. So we had 100 employees plus a spouse, and that gave us two, about a budget of $2,000 to spend on the party. We excluded bonuses from the party cost because that should be, I felt, should be calculated in the wage expenses instead of the party cost. Uh, we decided on a date of December 10th. We were going to rent the Dixie Center for five hours, and we were going to have uh, a gift exchange uh, included, like a little gift get uh, game where it's like white elephant gifts that get stolen around. Um, we had some employees come up to us and ask us if we could use another employee for a DJ to kind of give him some uh, additional funds as well as to kind of give him some experience doing his, his side gig. So we booked him for $150. And uh, another employee's spouse ran a cater catering company called Cater Co. And she offered it to cater and serve the event for $500, which was the cost of food. So we came in after the venue and all that, at, right at $2,000. Okay. So we have our network diagrams here, which show our critical paths. I know who made that. <laughs> <laughs> so, as you can see, explain that much. A C D E F G H I. Very simple. Very simple. simple. Yep. So, this thing flashing is really kind of. Yeah, I don't even understand why it's doing so that. It's crazy. Here is our Gantt chart which shows, if you can see it, uh, our start date was November 21st, and so we did some uh, project management, which was making all the Gantt charts and planning uh, all the back-end work, assigning team members and stuff like that. We then assembled a party team of employees that would uh, uh, then plan the party, and then they also would book the venue. Uh, and then the Cater Co. company told us it would take three days a day to buy the food, a day to, you know, eight hours to buy the food, their day, a day to uh, uh, prep the food, and then a day to deliver and serve the food uh, for us. Our DJ of DJ Bobby, he's uh, coming in uh, for an hour uh, the day before the party to do the uh, sound checks and uh, assemble the, the playlist and stuff like that. And then the party itself started on December 10th at, I think, 5 p.m. And then we went the rest of the, the way from there. So Until the police came. Basically, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, and then Eli had a work breakdown structure, but he didn't uh, get that over to us yet. And so I made one anyway, because that's how I <laughs> <laughs> And this breaks it down hour for hour on, on those days. Um, and so you can see the day of the party, it's broken down five to six, set up party, and the white elephant game, and then we eat food with music, and then we clean up after the party for an hour. And who was assigned was the teams that we uh, had the employees during that project management time assemble the teams and, and assign the teams. So, and then Josie made all Project Charter, you'd like to I'm finish Hallie, it up? but I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, Bad names. She helped, this is, this is us. Um, project name, Christmas party team Z. And then the impact of the project was to improve morale and have fun. And then you scroll down. What is that? Um, stakeholders is just us, Steel Wall Appliances. Project Scope was to throw a Christmas party for the employees to engage with other w with each other and each other's families. Um, objectives were to increase morale, have fun, and get to know each other. 
and then deliverables for catering, DJ venues, or venue games, and gifts. And then project milestones. Um, on November 23rd, the party, plan party planning was complete. December 3rd, venue was booked. December 10th, food prep was done. December 9th, DJ planned his playlist, and then the party took place on December 10th. Uh, some of the risks were <laughs> salmonella. <laughs> that was a high risk. And then the <laughs> DJ cancels was a low risk. And the gift game could be over budget. That was kind of a medium. I did have a crash. You got in a crash or something, yeah, so hopefully it's all right. Crash. So hopefully it's okay. Why not here today? Got yeah. yeah, wreck with somebody. Got to remember. Sounds like we backed him up. Yeah. <laughs> he did do the chart, though. He did the chart. Yeah. Okay. So, but it was a little incomplete, so I have one in the way. So, what software did you use to do all that stuff? Excel. You did that in Excel. It was very nicely done. Yeah. It was for sure. So, yeah. I really followed nice the. Thing. We lucked out getting in getting his group, so. so. Yeah. <laughs> so well, what do y'all think? Good job. Good. I don't know why we're getting that flashing back. Andrew, off. you going to need this? Yeah. For yours? Probably. Okay. Okay. Team three. That's us, yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> start off with our project charter. Uh, the project is a work Christmas party. Uh, this project started on November 8th uh, and the party happened on December 10th. The project purpose uh, for everyone to get together and enjoy each other's company and possibly win prizes. Project participants Joel, Eric, and myself. The sponsor, best company ever. Uh, project risks, going over budget, not securing a vendor in, or a venue in time, uh, running out of food. Our resources were budget, employees, and time. Scope of our project, reserve a venue to hold a party, make food selection, delegate personnel to obtain gift cards, distribute budget according to plan, hire and entertain, hire the entertainment in time for the party. Our budget was 30.4K, uh, and you can see the breakdown. Maybe not. Maybe not. Yeah, we could. 800 for the venue, 1,800 for the food, 24,000 for bonuses, 1,800 <laughs> for gift cards, and $2,000 for a hypnotist. It's gonna be an interesting party. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we have our Gantt chart, among other things. Um, and you can see we have our... You can't see. <laughs> oh, the class. There you go. Oh We've got our network table here. Uh, and to the right, you've got the, net, uh, the uh, AON diagram uh, and the critical path notated with the red arrow. Maybe. Um, you can see our legend here um, with the forward, backward, the duration, and the slack in the center. Critical path, planning, send out invites, sign up sheet, menu, dinner, and give speech. Um, our budget is here, um, and this Gantt chart here, like Jake's, uh, I took a, uh, a play out of his book. Uh, that Gantt chart, you can see in yellow are completed tasks with the diamond milestones on them. You can see that uh, some of the items, because it's not December 10th, are not completed or have not started yet, but you can see the progress, some of our 50%, uh, 
some are completed, uh, have not started, in progress, and so on and so forth. If you come down to the night of, you can see the itinerary. We'll be welcoming guests from 7 to 7.15. Hey, how you doing? Welcome. Uh, from 7.15 to 8, we're going to be eating. That's good stuff. Nom nom. Mm -hmm. uh, from 8.10 to 8.30, we will be talking about corporate values. Those places where we've contributed uh, charitably, uh, the annual revenue coming in, milestones that we have made throughout the year. Then we get on, get on to the good part. 8.30 to 9.30, the hypnotist, right? Who's the chicken now? Okay. Then, the last 15 minutes uh, of the party, we'll be giving a speech. Joel will be doing that. Yeah. And we will be passing out bonuses. And there you go. So, the last two presenters, both, both teams talked about risk, risk analysis. Well done to think about that. And I don't know, the DJ not showing up might be a higher risk than you think, because what are you going to do if they don't? Beatbox. Okay, if you've got a playlist already made up, that's your fallback position. you got a playlist already made up if the DJ doesn't show. So that's, something, that's how you manage the risk. And, and you talked about risk as well from Salmonella and... That was that Jake. Was guys. Yeah. 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 What was your risk? Run out of food. Run out of food, yeah, okay. Which... We also, sorry, I forgot something. We have... Oh, it's not going to show it. Where'd it go? There it is. Our work breakdown structure. Okay. Right? Uh, the planning, inside the planning, decide the revenue, decide the budget, uh, decide uh, the menu, the date, and then assign activities. Uh, after assigning activities, we need to secure the venue, contact the desired venue, and we went off with Joel with the Dixie Center. Yeah. Dixie Center. Yeah, she there. has experience there. Uh, check for availability, then we booked that. Uh, sending out invites, it's a breakdown, get a list of the employees, envelopes, create invites, stuff the envelopes, stamp the envelopes, uh, and so on. I mean, it's, it's all there. Uh, entertainment, book the hypnotist, give the boundaries for the hypnotist, right? We don't want to get too crazy, or maybe we do. Uh, pay the deposit, and then enjoy the show. Okay. All right. What do you think? Good? Okay. All right. Good job. Problem with the, the house. Yeah, I don't know what's going the on with that. house projector is there. I don't know. We've watched a lot of hours. And haven't seen that. All right, team four. Piece of recommendation is. Oh, you're going to need the dongle too? No. I didn't kind of decide to actually make it into electronics. That's all right. It didn't have to be. So, just a suggestion don't ever, ever, ever volunteer for the Christmas party hypnotist. <laughs> don't, ever, don't ever do that. I feel very lacking now. Everyone else had. Computers and fun stuff. That's like right. That. That's here. You got it. As you can. Beautiful. No, we kept ours very uh, short, simple, and pleasing. We only had a party of eight, so it was. We just took it to Fiesta Fun. We had a lot of kiddos with us, so that took up majority of it. Um. Yeah, I, I don't know. You guys all had good ones. I'm sitting here with paper. Oh, Don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. Well, no. any. That wasn't the assignment. You did not have to have power. Right. right. I specifically well, I said these that. These guys are like. <laughs> we're, we're over Who else was on your team? Uh, Tom and Brad. Okay. Yeah. It was Brad's idea to do it at Fiesta Fun, and Tom was going to bring his two girlfriends, and I was going to bring my little party. So. <laughs> didn't know Tom had, or, well, not Tom, Brad. I was gonna say Tom's got a wife. Yeah, I Tom's got a wife. Just saying. That's not going. That's, that's gonna be. That is on tape right there. That's on tape. Watch this one. Had him switch. For record, had him switch. 
Um, anywho, yeah, so our budget was about 10000 uh, We just rented out Fiesta Fun for a two-hour block from 6 to 8. Um, we started out with uh, pizza, root beer, drinks, that kind of stuff, just to kind of get everyone to settle down and everybody have some fun. Afterwards, uh, whoever was capable, play a laser tag, you know, go play laser tag for 30 minutes, and afterwards, whoever got the highest score would spin a wheel and get a prize, whether that be a gift basket or actual money. Uh, then we would go to bowling, and again, whoever got the best bowling out of all of it would spin the wheel again. And at the end, everyone got their bonuses of 500 and called it a good time and headed home. All right. So, it's on record. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, good. Can we turn that in? Yeah. Outstanding. I put uh, all this down there. Oh, okay, perfect. All right. Very good job. Sweet. Good job. Yeah. That was a good job. Yeah. yeah. Paper. They all owe, they all owe you one now. Yeah. yeah. You, you you took a, a hit for the team. You went up and made the presentation. Well, that was a good job by everybody. Thank you for doing that. That's an example of uh, how hard and how simple it is to do a project management, right? It's, it's both. When the stakes get high and the budgets, are people putting pressure on us on the budgets and the risks are real, uh, it's tougher. It, 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 uh, it amps it all up uh, for sure. So what I want to do uh, at this point, we're, I don't know how Green Bay and the Titans are doing. Does anybody know on that? <laughs> Eric, I figured you'd be it. I figured Eric would be up to date on that one. Uh, we are going to end up with a video on project cost management, and we'll do the exercise next class. Uh, let's return to this. I'm, I'm really concerned why our PowerPoint is flashing back and forth, so we may be Maybe we don't even do that. 14-6 Titans. 14-6 Titans? Uh-oh. That's not in the second quarter. Uh-oh. That's bad in Green Bay. <laughs> I'm not going to like that. All right. Um, hopefully, we don't have this flashing back and forth, so uh, we will see. We're going we're gonna to walk through cost management from the uh, Project Management Institute's perspective. Uh, this is uh, taken from Chapter 7 of the 6th edition of the PMBOK. Uh, you have, uh, as our text, this, the 7th edition. Uh, so it's not exactly the same uh, diagrams and all of that because of the, dif dif the difference in the edition. Uh, but the, the content is all the same for project cost management. Figuring out how to diagram and figuring out how to keep track of costs hasn't changed since, uh, you know, uh, Noah built the ark or whatever. You know, cost management is a, an issue. So now we're going to talk about Chapter 7 in the PMBOK Guide, Project Cost Management. Before I get started, let me mention that if you're interested, we have lots of free PMB prep materials at projectprep.org. Got cheat sheets, full length practice tests, note cards, lots of stuff that should be pretty helpful. So there's four processes in this chapter. There's three in planning, one in monitoring and controlling. So we have plan cost management where we're documenting how to manage and control our costs. We're probably gonna include our estimating method uh, in there. Then we're actually gonna estimate our costs, approximate the finances needed to complete project and activities. We're approximating the cost of those activities. And the next, determine budget, is where we're aggregating those costs of activities together and generating the cost baseline, the approved version of our costs, or our budget, and then we're going to use that as a comparison to actuals later. We want to compare the baseline to the actuals. And then we're going to control our costs, monitoring project costs and managing change to the cost baseline. That's in monitoring and controlling. And now let's talk about estimating costs. So there's four really key techniques for estimating them. The first is analogous estimating, using historical data from a similar activity or a project. So we're looking at the past and saying, you know, we've done something similar, 
or we've seen something done you know, in a similar fashion, and we think it would cost this much. Uh, I think of the word analogy, you're making an analogy or a comparison to a different project. And there's parametric estimating using an algorithm to calculate cost or duration based on historical data. It's similar to analogous, but you're using algorithms, math, stats, to, to come up with a number. And the way that I remember this is that it has parametric in the name. So metric, I think mathematical or an algorithm. And there's three point estimating, averaging optimistic, pessimistic, and most likely estimates. And finally, bottom up estimating, that's aggregating estimates of lower level components of the WBS. We're starting at the low level from the bottom and adding them up. Now in the estimate cost process, there's two key outputs, activity cost estimates, that's just the cost to complete project activities that could include labor, materials, equipment, services, IT, and so on. So we have the estimates themselves, and then we have a basis of estimates. It's basically just data or details supporting the estimate that we came up with. We talk about what method we use, any assumptions that were made, and a range of possible estimates perhaps. So we should have our cost estimates and a basis for how we got to that estimate. Okay, but here's an example of a, an estimate that we might come up with. Maybe we're developing a social web application. We may uh, need to look at the cost of storing the data in a database, the cost of a web server, and the cost to develop applications for desktops and mobile devices. Those could be all potential parts of a cost, esti a cost estimate that we come up with for a social web application. Okay, now let's move from estimating costs, so approximating the cost of activities, to determining the budget, where we're aggregating all those costs together and coming up with our cost baseline. Now the cost baseline is the key output here, and really what it is, it's the approved version of the budget minus any reserve, management reserve. And we use this cost baseline to compare to our actuals later. So if you recall, management reserve is just, it's contingency, it's backup if something goes wrong. Because um, things, unexpected things always happen on projects. And so it's good to have a little bit of contingency. But what we want to use as a basis for comparison to our actuals is our cost baseline. Uh, the aggregation, or the adding up of all of our activity costs. So that's one of the outputs of determined budget. Another is going to be project funding requirements. This is the forecasted project cost to be paid. Are we going to get uh, the funding for our project all at once in total? Or are we going to get them in a periodic, um, or do we have periodic requirements for those? For example, do you need a million dollars this month and two million dollars next month? If so, you need to plan for that in your funding requirements. Now let's talk about earned value management. Now, just to kind of get this conversation started, I want to just remind you a couple things about project costs, and this could go for um, other constraints in our project. But we have a baseline, which is our planned budget. Those are our planned costs. And then we have actuals, our actual costs. Now, if you look at this chart on the right, um, it's showing you how we're spending on a particular project cost over time. And so it looks like because the red line is our planned cost and the green line is our cost to date it looks like you know maybe we're actually doing pretty well under budget we have a little bit of room and so if something does go wrong we've got um, some management reserve or contingency it looks like we're understanding which in some cases is perfectly fine now but what this is neglecting though is scope because we want to think about the triple constraint cost schedule and scope so even though we may be underspending based on our our plans, the question is, did we get less scope accomplished by the time that we originally planned here? So maybe we're spending less, but we only got half of the scope accomplished that we had intended by this time in the project. So we want to think about cost, schedule, and scope all at the same time. And so earned value management can help us with that. So basically we're combining triple constraint measurements to assess project performance and project. So we're kind of looking at the cost baseline, the schedule baseline, and the scope baseline, all really at the same time, in an integrated way, into an integrated baseline. And we're asking the question, have we completed the planned scope within the budgeted costs and time? So we're looking at all three of those constraints at the same time. So um, for each work package in our WBS, Earned Value Management monitors, monitors three key dimensions, plan value, 
earned value, and actual costs. So plan value is the authorized budget assigned to an activity, and that doesn't include management reserve, because if you remember, we're using our cost baseline uh, that excludes management reserve to compare to our actuals. So it's our authorized budget for an activity. Um, and the total plan, like if you add all the plan value up for each activity on the project, you're going to have your budget in completion, your BAC. Uh, and so plan value, total plan value, is really our budget in completion, what we budgeted to spend by the end of the project. Then there's earned value. The question is, of what we had originally planned, how much have we earned? What have we earned? What have we accomplished? Uh, and the EV is often used to calculate the percent complete on a project. So really we're looking at what we've done. That's the percent complete. How much have we earned? What work have we actually done? I think is when we look at an example in a second, I think that'll make more sense. Uh, then there's actual cost. This is what we actually spent to get the work done uh, that we're measuring in EVM. And so the actual cost will have no upper limit. Whatever is spent to achieve the EV will be measured. In an ideal world, all of these are aligned. Plan value equals earned value equals actual cost, but that's really net rarely the case. And so we're looking at all three of these at the same time. And we already mentioned this, but plan value is going to equal our budget of completion, our total plan value, our plan value for all the activities. That's what we have budget to spend at the completion of the project. A couple other measurements to look at in EVM is estimate to completion and estimate at completion. So estimate to completion is looking at how much additional money do we expect we will spend? An estimated completion, it looks like, or is uh, telling us how much do we think we're going to spend in total once the project is done. Things that are already complete, that we've already spent, and what we have estimated still to spend. So estimate at completion equals actual cost plus estimate to completion. So it's what we've already spent plus we, what we expect we'll spend from now until the end of the project. That's our estimate at completion. Okay, let me give you an example here of a video gaming system, maybe Nintendo Switch. So let's say that, and this is a simplified example, but we're looking at getting the project done in five months. And each month we're planning to accomplish the uh, work that's mentioned here. So in month one, we want to collect customer feedback. In month two, design the system. In month three, prototype it, and so on. And then in the bottom row, you're going to see our budget what we plan to spend, our plan value, for each month and each piece of work. Now imagine this. If after month three, see it's at the end of month three, so you assumed or you hoped that we would have gotten collecting customer feedback, designing the system, and prototyping the system done. This is what we plan to have accomplished. But what if you've only got the first two things done You've only collected customer feedback and designed the system, and you spent six million to do that. So, you had you know um, three pieces of work planned, but you only got two of them done, and you spent quite a bit of it to get it accomplished. There's a problem here. So you're behind schedule and over budget. So take a look at this. So you only got an earn. You only earned collecting customer feedback and designing the system because that's all you got accomplished. So you only earned that budget. And so you add 500,000 to 3 million, that's going to give you 3.5 million. That's what you've earned. We budgeted that much for those two activities. So that's what you've earned. You've only got those two things done. But the problem is you've spent 6 million to get them accomplished. So 6 million is going to be your actual cost, your earned value, is going to be three and a half million, and then your plan value is going to be well above that. You're going to add five hundred thousand plus three million plus five million because you expected at the end of month three you're going to have those three things accomplished. So what this tells me is that we're behind schedule and over budget based on our EVM calculations. So earned value equals three and a half million, and actual cost equals six million. So we've earned a lot less than we've spent. Bad measurement. We've overspent here.
talked about earned value on the first day of class. And we're going to look at this same chapter from a different guy's point of view and review it. And then we will do, the first and next class, we will do an actual example, an exercise, looking at the estimate of completion, which is what our boss wants to know. What are we going to spend when we get this done, and what day is that going to be? How far away are we from that? So ultimately, this is building up to that last piece of information that is important for our boss to hear. So, Welcome back once again. So moving forward, super excited. We're going to talk about in this lesson about cost management. So you as a project manager need to understand how to control costs that you're incurring internally or maybe externally, running around meetings, talking to clients, and so forth. So not only those, the actual project costs as well. So I'm going to talk about how to control, how to plan, how to estimate, determine, and then of course control those costs. You may have instances where clients would have change orders. So you're working on a project for your client and all of a sudden they say, well, we want some additional software being developed or we want a third party application being integrated with the existing software that you as a project manager are managing. So you need to ensure how to handle those change orders or change controls. In this lesson, I'm gonna move forward and talk about those. And let's take a look at, jump right in, about the details of scheduling cost management. Welcome back, super excited, moving into chapter seven. In this lesson, I'm gonna talk about the project cost management. So I'm going to cover the main concept that project managers need to understand regarding cost management. However, there are certain formulas that is if you are interested in your PMP exam, for example, I will also highlight different formulas towards the end of the lesson, but I'm not going to explain all of these uh, formulas. So that's something that I will assign that to you as a homework, you can say, or you can study on your own, because this is something that you have to practice with all these formulas. So I will provide several resources, as well as talk about the important formulas at the end, but it's something that I will leave that to you. And I've also explained that in the beginning of this course that I'm not gonna, and this course is not all about just passing the exam, by the way, it's practical project management, right? So you need to understand how a project manager in the real world would face any of these challenges. So let's jump right in, moving into cost management. Here's the overview. So the cost management from a project manager's perspective includes the processes that are involved, starting from planning all the way to controlling costs, right? So that includes estimating, budgeting, finances, funding, managing, and controlling, so that you can take your project and complete it within the approved budget. And this is by far the most challenging aspect because costs can very easily go out of control. In my experience, when you work on projects, uh, sometimes you don't have control over the costs. There are certain instances where there's nothing you can do. For example, one of the employees just quit on you, right? So one of the lead developers, and now you have to hire an external resource, but you cannot go through the entire process of HR, right, hiring that employee because that may take weeks or months. And here you are as a project manager, you need to make a decision. So that cost go up if you would hire an external resource immediately, right? So that's you know a real world example that I just gave. So the project cost management processes, once again, are planning the cost management, which is the process of defining how the project costs will be estimated, budgeted, managed, monitored, and controlled. So as a good project manager, you always would like to have some kind of extra budget, right, or contingency planning, I should say, within the cost management as well. Second is the estimated costs, which is the process of developing an approximation of monetary resources needed to complete project work. Next is determining the budget itself, which is the process of aggregating the estimated costs of individual activities or work packages to establish an authorized cost baseline. And then finally, the controlling of these costs, which is the process of monitoring the status. 
Here's the overview from the Pinbox 6 guide. So 7.1, 2, 3, and then 7.4, which are the four aspects of project cost management, which are presented as discrete processes, right? They define interfaces, while in practice they overlap. So once again, this chart may be a little smaller, but refer to the resource guide that I provided, the sixth guide, as a downloadable resource, and just kind of go through it. And I would assign that as a homework to you. So go through all of these areas, and if you have any questions, post them in the discussion area. But overall, understand conceptually that these areas are part of the cost control. But on some projects, especially those are smaller scopes, you may not incur all of these phases, right? The cost budget is more tightly coupled and linked and can be viewed as a single process. So these are, again, guidelines provided by the Project Management Institute. As a project manager, you ought to know these, right? So as you dive into projects, of course, you start off with a smaller project. I don't think any enterprise company is going to assign you a complex project, especially if you're starting as project managers. So you always start with small projects and then you build on these concepts. Here are the key concepts that I want to cover regarding cost management. It's primarily concerned with the cost of resources needed to complete project activities. So, for example, if you need to hire someone, at what pay rate you hire vendors, what is the cheapest vendor you can find to do the job, and so forth. If you need to hire an extra space, for example, for an office, you need to consider all of the uh, factors that relate to those costs. So project cost management should consider the effect of project decisions on the recurring or subsequent recurring cost of using, maintaining, and then supporting whatever it is that you're actually working on as a project, whether it's service or product. So for example, a limited number of design reviews can reduce the cost of project, but at the same time could increase the resulting product's operating costs. So different stakeholders measure project costs in different ways and you as a project manager need to understand the level of these stakeholders and the expectations. Another example is the cost of an acquired item may be measured when the acquisition decision is made or committed. The order is placed, the item is delivered, or the actual cost is incurred or reported for project accounting purposes. So again, these are some of the areas that you need to understand as a project manager. A real life uh, live example that I can give you from my experience is, uh, for instance, the customer has ordered a software product that you or your organization needs to implement for the customer, right? Now they've already signed off on the approvals and you've already obtained all the approvals for purchasing the software or you have the, the, the PO as well from the customer purchase order. But the third party software that you wish to purchase for your customer is on sale, for example, right? Or the licenses are 20% off for another week or so. So you have to make a decision whether you purchase now and obtain the benefit of those 20% or wait. And then of course, when the time comes of implementation of the software, which may be a couple of months down the road, purchase then. But at that point in time, you are not going to get the 20% discount offer. So those are, again, the decisions that you, and you as a project manager, and of course, um, including your stakeholders, you need to make and then move forward with that. So planning cost management is one of the first phase. I'm just going to skim through it. You can take a look at all these uh, detailed phases, but it's simply the process of defining how the project costs will be estimated, budgeted, managed, monitor and control. So the inputs, tools and techniques, and the outputs, right? Again, we follow the same methodology as we have been in the previous lectures. Second is the estimate cost, same input, tools, and output. So in order to estimate cost, which is again the process of developing an approximation of the costs of resources needed to complete the project. And the key benefit of this process is that it determines the monetary resources that are required for the project. So for instance, inputs include, of course, your project management plan, your cost management plan, your documents, other environmental factors, 
the tools in estimating costs could be an expert judgment. In other words, you want to hire some external cost accountant if you don't have the in-house expertise to do the cost estimation for you. Or you can do some parametric tests like statistical tests you can run if you have the skills and abilities within the organization. You can do a three-point bottom-up and do other data analysis. So again, this is something that you need to evaluate as the company itself, whether the company that you are working as a project manager for has all of these expertise or not. And if you do, of course, use them. And then you will get the outputs as well. Third is the determined budget, which is again the process of aggregating the estimated costs of individual activities. So now you're breaking down costs based on individual tasks. For example, software installation, that's a task. What's it gonna cost? Next, you have how many people you wish to have on this particular task, or what is that going to cost, and so on. The project budget components, cost estimates for the different activities or tasks or subtasks, along with any contingency reserves for these activities. Typically in the real world, we do about, I'd say about 20 to 30% contingency planning, okay? So your cost would include an additional 30% for your project or for these activities or tasks or subtasks. So the work package cost estimates along with any contingency reserves for these are aggregated into control accounts. So you have the total amount, as you can see in the chart here, the project budget, then from that project budget, you have a management reserve chunk, you have the cost baseline created, you have the control accounts, from the control accounts amount, you have the contingency reserve, and then the actual task costs, and so on. So this way, as a project manager, you can kind of take a look at the total budget and then kind of divide it and then allocate accordingly. Here are the budget components. Since the cost estimates that make up the baseline that you've created earlier are directly tied to all of these tasks and subtasks and activities, this enables a time-phased view of the baseline, which is typically like an S-curve, right? So it looks like an S-curve. So the cost based on expenditures and funding requirements are listed in this graph. The cumulative value is on the y-axis or vertical and then on the x-axis you have the time, right? So as time progresses, your funding requirements increase, right? Based on the total budget. So just kind of take a look at this concept of the project budget components. So each component you can break down and then lay it out on a graph. Finally, the controlling costs, which again, you as a project manager, you can also hire external individuals or from within the organization, you can do different data analysis, such as earned value analysis, variance analysis, trend analysis, and these are all statistical techniques that you can use to control the costs. So if you're interested in, again, like I mentioned in the beginning of this lesson, interested in the project PMP certification, then there are formulas that you would have to understand and calculate as a project manager all of these areas within cost estimation, right? In terms of controlling costs, scheduling costs, allocating costs, estimating costs, and so on. So the project cost control includes the factors that create changes to the authorized cost baseline ensuring that all the change requests are active in a timely manner. And again, these are just the guidelines as a project manager, you need to keep that in mind, right? So as you gain more experience in projects, you would actually be doing all of these. You'll be managing the actual change when and as they occur, ensuring the costs do not exceed the authorized funding or by a work breakdown structure component. And a good example is, for example, the dev team has given you a work breakdown structure. In other words, the, the lead developer has told you that, hey, it's going to take five hours to install Office 365 or SharePoint on the server. Well, it actually ends up taking the team eight hours, right? 
So that way you need to ensure that the costs do not exceed the funding. So you need to let the, the lead developer know that, hey, we only have five hours to do this, right? Similarly, monitoring cost performance to isolate and understand the variances or the variability of these costs from the approved cost baseline. Monitoring work performance against funds expected or expended, rather. Well, this is something important because as a project manager, you sometimes get too much tied into the actual tasks and the completion of tasks and meeting the deadlines. You kind of shy away from these cost control methodology, right? So kind of work side by side and break down each of these tasks that, and the costs that you associated with it. Uh, just kind of monitor them very closely. So the cost control also includes preventing unapproved changes from being included in the costs, informing stakeholders of all approved changes and associated costs, bringing expected cost overruns within acceptable limits. So towards this part, you need to kind of make sure that your stakeholders, your boss, or senior management are also in the loop of, with all these costs that are, are being incurred and managed and controlled by you as a project manager. Perfect, so quick recap, we talked about the cost management within a project. Of course, we didn't highlight all the formulas, so next, before I end this lesson, let me give you a flavor of some of the common formulas. I will also provide several downloadable resources, and I would like you to practice with all of these single formulas. And if you don't understand any of these, of course, post them in the discussion area, I would be glad to help. But since that's not part of the course, my focus is not too much on the certification itself, but actually giving the skills and abilities to become a practical project manager. And by the way, the certification for the certification, you need to wait in a couple of years before you get the experience, before you can actually appear for the exam, by the way. So if you're just a beginner and starting off as a project manager, you'd have to go through and get the experience anyways, right? So this is a perfect course for you in that respect. So let's switch to a Word document that I have to show you all the formulas. Here we go. These are the common cost management knowledge areas or the PMP formulas. There are about more than 25 formulas, so to speak, on average. But I've listed the, the top eight common formulas that you need to know for sure. And then the rest of them you can kind of take a look at and, and use them and learn them as well. I will provide you uh, several links and sites that, I, that kind of talk about all these formulas and there's several other resources that you can take a look at as well. So the top eight ones are cost variance, schedule variance, cost performance index, schedule performance index, the EAC. So these are the areas that you need to take a look at and work with. Once you have mastered these common formulas, then you can, of course, take a look at the rest of them. So I will provide you with this document. You can take a look at this and just kind of go through all of these formulas and understand what the earned value cost is and so on. <coughs> Excuse me. We are going to go through those formulas with a real exercise together in class on Tuesday. So we'll... Leave off, leave off with knowing there's formulas there. Excuse me. We don't have to memorize those formulas. You just need to know a cheat sheet where they're at. And, and uh, they make common sense. By the time we're done with them, I think you'll be comfortable with what the formulas are. You actually started doing those formulas on day one of the class when we went through that exercise. And, and so... I told you you didn't know what they meant at that point, but you still were able to manage through them. Now we're going, now we're closing the full circle. We're going back to, now you will understand what they, they, they are, are about, and we'll go through them together with a practical example, kind of like the ones that we were doing on the, uh, example one, two, and three. And I will have a table for you on example three, and we'll see, uh, could be we're both wrong, uh, and, and uh, we'll, we'll come up with, uh, the right answer, I'll, I'll hand that out on, on Tuesday. So it is uh, eight, after 8, so it's time for us to call it the class. Thank you all. Have a great weekend, and we will see you on Tuesday.